Hi, and welcome to Extra Serving, a podcast by Nation's Restaurant News. I'm your host, Holly Petrie. Today, we're going to be talking about acquisitions. Fat Brands has made another acquisition. The company acquired Smoky Bones, the barbecue casual dining concept, for $30 million. This comes in the wake of legal trouble for Fat Brands' former CEO and board member, Andy Wiederhorn. Fat Brands has made a name for itself over the past few years when it acquired four companies in 2021. Last year, Fat Brands acquired Nestle Tollhouse Cafe, and this is the first acquisition since then. What does that mean for Fat Brands? Are they coming back onto the market? Next, we'll be talking about Panera Brands. The company, owner of Caribou Coffee, Einstein Bros Coffee, and Panera, has appointed two new members to its board ahead of its highly anticipated IPO launch. Many think this executive shakeup in the wake of the chain's new CEO, who was named to the position this year, is one of the final steps in Panera Brands going public. When can these two executives bring to the table? Finally, we're going to be talking about a deep dive into the top 500. We have been pouring through the data to give you segmented data on restaurants. Now, it's time to talk about them. This week's interview is Francis Allen, CEO of Checkers and Rallies. And now it's time to introduce my co-hosts. I'm Leanne Zinsmeister, Managing Editor of Nation's Restaurant News. I'm Joanna Fantosi, Senior Editor with Nation's Restaurant News. Welcome, Joanna. So nice to have you here. Hi, it's nice to be on a here on another episode of the Girls Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I don't the know if any of you I don't know if any of you the right age to have watched the Amanda show, but that makes me think of the girls room yeah. from there. Yeah, the I girls room. For reference. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I don't know how old you guys are. I don't know what the generation was, but that's what I think of every time I say it. So just so you guys know, and so our, I'm sure all young female listenership to this podcast knows. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, so Joanna, you wrote some stories this week. Let's just say that. You were writing the big news this week. As I tend to do. <laughs> <laughs> but you got all the big stories this week. That was all you. So very, very impressive. Good for you. A round of applause for you, Joanna. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so which would you rather talk about, Joanna? They're your brands, fat brands or Panera brands? Well, I'd love to talk about both, but you know I can talk about fat brands all day. <laughs> um, it's, such an, it's such an interesting company, to say the least. It's kind of a mild adjective, but it's... I guess fascinating would be it's just like a really interesting company to watch. Um, I thought that the time goes by so fast when I was researching this story. Um, I guess I had um, I had thought that their spending spree or acquisition spree happened more recently than it did, but it was 2021. Uh, I thought the when, same thing when they basic. I thought it was 2022, but it was 2021 when they acquired pretty much everyone under the sun uh including most notably Fazoli's um and this is pretty interesting because um he- here is my prediction right so um they just acquired Smoky Bones which is you know their first foray into into barbecue but this is not the first time that they've worked with Sun Capital what set off their acquisition spree was Johnny Rockets which was purchased from Uh, Sun Capital in 2020. Do you know what else Sun Capital owns? Friendlings. (laughs) Prediction there. I don't know. Uh, It's just, it's just, they always love acquiring everything. They really do. I thought that spending free was last year too. And I looked back at this story and I'm like, oh my God, it was 2021. And they only acquired one brand last year, right, Joanna? Yeah. Toll House, uh, the Toll House cookie brand. Um, I think it's just specifically the uh the like store the the retail or store area of Toll House, like not the um not the grocery store products. <laughs> so when uh, they when they made this these acquisitions in twenty twenty one, I mean, what were you thinking? You wrote a really long piece on it that I think everybody should go read on NRN. But what do, what were you thinking when they were making all these acquisitions? So um a couple of things about this is I do feel like when they did go on their acquisition spree, um, people were concerned and because this is not normal behavior for a company. Um and usually acquisitions are much more thoughtful. Um, but in this case, I just feel like and, and I was talking to, you know, some experts on the matter, um, that they just were kind of a lot of it was like bargain bin shopping. That sounds awful to say. It's kind of a mean thing to say, but uh <laughs> they were just looking to bolster their portfolio in any, in any way that they can. 
Um, and I think that that's kind of their strategy is just kind of bulldozing ahead and getting building up as many stores and restaurants as possible. Um, and a lot of the a lot of the brands, what, what a lot of the brands had in common um, that that they acquired is that they were struggling or had seen better days. But that's not the case here. I don't think I'm not quite as familiar with Smoky Bones, but I feel like they they had been kind of up and coming and kind of a, they're kind of an interesting brand to watch. They don't feel like other brands that were kind of had their heyday already. Um, like I feel like Johnny Rockets might be a good example of that. Well, so how does this fit into their portfolio? I know you said it's kind of a wide array of things. So let's put it that way. Um, yeah. But this is a casual dining barbecue concept. Right. So um, they are, they, they've never been in barbecue before. And so I think that they're just kind of looking to acquire one of everything. It just, that's kind of what it feels like, honestly. <laughs> um, they, it, the, you know, the casual dining bit of it, I do feel like most or many of their brands, I will say, uh, I don't know if most or many of their brands are casual dining. So that kind of fits in for sure. Um, and so, and then on top of all that, we haven't even touched upon, you know, the, um, Andy Wiederhorn's, uh, legal troubles. Um, and so it, the, the Fat Brands has been out of the news for a while since the latest updates with that. And, um, he is, you know, he stepped down from CEO, but he's still very much involved in the company, obviously. I mean, this definitely, this it has, in my opinion, Andy Wiederhorn's footprints all over, uh, fingerprints all over it. Um, he actually, um, he put out a statement about, uh, the, the acquisition of Smoky Bones also, I mean, the, the, the new CEO, uh, the new co-CEO also did, um, but he's still very much involved in the business. You would think they wouldn't want to make so much noise. Yeah, <laughs> you would think. <laughs> So, Leanne, you know, it's our, oh, oh, sorry, I was just here, like our financial experts. That's what I was going to preface. Well, so I was going to, I guess, as our financial expert, if you want to call me that, but I was just going to pitch in that, like, it's funny for as random as the acquisition seemed to be, you know, like Joanna said, they cover a range of segments, categories, like one of everything under the sun. And for all of Andy Wiederhorn's legal troubles, I also can't point to anything that says this isn't working. I feel like when they were in the middle of that acquisition tear two years ago, we were all just like waiting for the other shoe to drop. We were like, this is going to crash and burn, right? They're going to like somehow all of these restaurants are going to flop. Like what? It didn't it didn't make any sense. We had never seen anything like this in the restaurant industry before. But all of those chains are doing just fine. Twin Peaks just had like one of its best years ever. Um, I mean, we're going to get into top 500, but one of the things we talked about when we launched the top 500 was like, holy cow, look at Twin Peaks go. And that's one that was acquired a couple years ago. The Johnny Rockets and the Fizzolis and those like kind of under the radar, maybe past their prime brands are doing well. You know, they're still in the news. They're making moves. Uh, so I guess like I'm pleasantly surprised by where we are at in the fat brand story like right now. Um, and so, and like Joanna said, you know, Smoky Bones is already doing well. We talk about them a fair amount. They were part of our barbecue showdown earlier this year. Uh, so I'm actually a little eager and excited to see like what happens next there. Uh, what can fat brands do with it? Um, I just wanted to take a moment to, I, I, it's kind of embarrassing it's happening on air, but uh, I just wanted to make sure that I correct something I just said. Uh, Sun Capital like had soul friendly. Sorry about that, guys. That completely slipped my mind. <laughs> I thought I was onto something. Anyway, they will obviously not be. I mean, hey, maybe they'll acquire friendlies, but not from Sun Capital. <laughs> um, and I, 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 I agree, Landa. I think that the um, the individual, br many of the individual brands under Fat Brands it, are doing well, but as a whole, I mean, when I had done this um, earlier this year. I did a, a pretty lengthy, as, as Holly, as you mentioned, I did a pretty lengthy uh, breakdown of this. Um, and the finances, is, it's hard to get in the weeds of it, but um, they're basic, just to, in layman's terms, they have a lot of debt. 
<laughs> they have a lot of financial that I feel like financially they've been on thin ice, thin ice for a while. And so, yeah, their strategy is just like, let's just keep acquiring and hope that that, you know, evens out. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's a strategy. I don't know how good it is, but that's a strategy and that's the strategy they're choosing to go with. Um, well, so let's kind of take it to the other side of this. That's Panera Brands. They've been doing really well. They acquired Panera Bread and they that's their flagship brand, but they also under the Panera Brands have Caribou Coffee and Einstein Bros. Um, and they formed this company. So now they have these two new executives in, Mike Tattersfield, the former CEO of Krispy Kreme, or he will be the former as of January 1st. Um, and then they brought in their, the former CEO of Starbucks, who, and they're both going to be on the board. Um, and so, Joanna, we were talking about this for an episode of First Bite, how Mike Tattersfield brought uh, Krispy Kreme through their IPO. So this, is, this looks like, from the outside, a move that is pointing right towards an IPO. But he won't start till January 1st. So is that something we're waiting on? And what do you think that's going to be, Joanna? Yeah, um, I think that this is just really all just making sure that they have the best people possible on um, on their board because, you know, the, the board kind of drives the ship when it comes to uh, being uh, getting ready to go public and being a public company and just making sure that they have all the all the best ducks in a row um, possible for uh, for going public. Uh, I, like I said on on uh, on First Bite that I do think that Mike Tarasville is, is a really good um, he's a really good fit. Uh, to lead the board, uh, which he will be doing so in January, because he um, he was the CEO of Caribou Coffee, uh, which is also under the Panera brand's umbrella now, um, and he used to be on the Panera board. He he was previously on the Panera board, and so I just think that they're just kind of trying to find the best fits uh, possible. Um, and obviously, uh, Patrick Gizmer, uh he has some great experience as being. Uh, CFO of Starbucks. Um, Starbucks, one of the most financially lucrative companies, um, food service companies out there. And so, you know, he had to have done something right as CFO. Um, and so I think that this is just all getting the runway ready for uh, for the IPO, which is pretty exciting. Um, I don't know 100% when that will happen. Um, I feel like we've been talking about their eventual IPO for a while. Yeah, a long time. We've been waiting for their new IPO to happen maybe for two years at this point that it's been rumored that they were going for an IPO and then they slowly develop Panera brands and they are beefing up their board. And it just, it seems like they're getting closer and closer, but Panera brands, I think at this point is maybe a year old that they did that at least. And so it's a really slow runway here. Yeah, for sure. Leanne, I'm curious, uh, your, your thoughts on that. <laughs> yeah. So it goes, I, uh, this is one where I don't really have a lot of commentary to add until we see how it shakes out, because I feel like all of this preparation and taking their time, and they came really close to an IPO like a year ago and then didn't do it. Uh, I feel like this slow and steady method feels right for this company and that, you know, they're laying a strong foundation for a really good, strong IPO. Uh, but we won't know until it happens. Maybe it's overcautious. Um, over preparing. I really, I could go either way as far as predictions go on this one. It's a really interesting IPO market this year. There have been fewer, but the ones that we've seen have been really strong. I mean, Kava just like blew everybody away in the fast casual IPO space earlier this year. Uh, so it'll, I, I'm watching it very, very eagerly, but as far as like predictions and speculation go, I really don't have much on this one. Um, yeah, I think that uh, I think it's uh, I think it'll be really interesting to see exactly when it happens. I, I do agree that it's a, that it's it has been less of a feeding frenzy when it comes to uh, when it comes to you know the the IPO space and uh, companies going public. Um, I think that this is a better route for them just because that um, actually. Crazily enough, I just looked this up because apparently, as we've learned today, I have no concept of time. Uh, the whole, is Danny Meyer going to merge mm. with, uh, da is Danny Meyer going to merge, um, with Panera Brands and going public thing? Uh, that actually happened in 2021. Uh, oh I thought God. it was, it, it was it, time goes by fast. Um, at the time I remember being like, what? This doesn't seem like a fit. Um, I think people were just, I mean, obviously it was, it was, uh, 
uh, it was Danny Meyer's investment group. So it wasn't specifically like, you know, Union Square Hospitality Group or anything like that. Um, but it, it was his, uh, his SPAC. Um, and so I do think that that would have been an odd fit. I think that this is a much, this is like you said, Leanne, this is a much better route for them to go. Um, and I think that, uh, it'll be, it'll be great to see them go public again. Cause they haven't been public since 2017. Um, so yeah, I think that this, this is. This is definitely the right move for this brand, um, and I think that it will, uh, it will debut at a at a pretty substantial price. If I had to guess, I, I'm not going to put a number out there because I don't know. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it'll be interesting to hear sort of the return on investment of their beverage program, the sips, and their how many Lloyd to members they have because they've said internally they have like sixty million. So I'm curious to see what those numbers are. I'm just curious to see behind the curtain at Panera because they've introduced all these really innovative things over the past few years. I mean, Joanna, you want to talk about all the tech that they have. So I'm curious to see how all of these have played out or paid off for them. Um, so I'll be curious when they go public to really watch a lot of those numbers that we haven't seen for six years. Panera is one of my favorite brands to cover, I will say, because um... And, and no, they are not sponsoring this video. Sorry. <laughs> um, they're just one of my favorite brands to cover because I think that they're kind of sneaky in that you don't realize how uh, successful they've been. And I mean, obviously, we don't have access to their numbers right now because they're not public yet. Um, but you don't know, you don't realize how successful they've been, how much they've been a leader in in uh, digital tech and, uh, you know, off-premises technology. I'd, um, you know, I'd said in... Um, in first bite that they were one of the first or if not the first uh chain to introduce geofencing during the during the pandemic uh when i covered it i had no idea what geofencing was and now it seems like every other day companies talking about um how they're introducing geofencing or utilizing geofencing technology um and they also have the you know the beverage um sub subscription program and i just think that that is such it, it's so successful for them right now um uh, I believe their their average check has gone up because of it because people that um, uh, people that are a part of the beverage subscription program are more likely to spend more because they feel like okay well I'm getting this drink for free I definitely got to come in here I'm I'm getting my drink for free my coffee or whatever I definitely have to come in here for a sandwich or or a bagel or whatever the case may be um, and I just think that it has it it is a um, it is a, a subscription, the subscription program has become a standard, I think, for the industry, because not that there have been too many, um, there haven't been too many other subscription programs, mostly other companies that have dabbled with is it's been like an LTO, that type of limited time type of thing. Um, but they, I just feel like they've really led the way. And um, so they've done all these innovative, interesting things over the past few years, um, kinding, kind of in leading up to this this runway to go public. Um, and I think that, you know, Jab, uh, their ownership has, has really done everything right to put all the ducks in a row to make sure that it's successful. Hopefully I don't eat my own words. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I, I have the green light up for on my end. <laughs> I eat my all words right, well, on this podcast every week. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's fine. Don't well, worry about it. We're going to eat some more because it's your turn. We're going to talk about top 500 and that is your area of expertise. Yes, but I'm going to talk about last year's like the top 500 numbers that are like already done and established. So hopefully fewer things that I'll have to walk back later, but we'll see. Uh, so our top 500 report obviously published back in June. I'm sure all of our listeners remember uh, but what you may not know is that every week I do a deep dive into some of the numbers online. Uh, so I'm going to, I've broken down all the full service segments already. So I'm just going to talk through some of those. And like a fun fact from each, maybe there are 16 restaurant segments on the top 500 represented. Uh, six of those are full service. 10 of those are limited service. Every segment grew sales last year. We've talked a lot about how great the industry did in 2022. Obviously, year over year, it was lapping some rough stuff in 2021. Uh, so some of this is not surprising, but it's still incredible. So we've got in the full service category, we've got what we call global regional, which are just restaurants that focus on 
like foods from a specific region, whether it's in the U.S. or uh, globally. The like regions represented in the top 10 are Chinese, Japanese, Brazilian, Mexican, and barbecue. Uh, that was the fastest growing full service restaurant segment last year. Uh, System wide, that category grew by almost 15% uh, by sales last year. So very impressive. We've got seafood and steak restaurants. Um, lots of shuffling around in like the four through 10 spots this year, uh, which is interesting. So if you're in the like seafood steak category, I like to say, keep an eye out. There's a lot of like movement happening in your category. Uh, we've got what we call American, which is like basically code for they primarily serve burgers and fries. Uh, something I love in this segment is that it has a newcomer in the top 10 and that newcomer is Lazy Dog, which we love here at NRN because Lazy Dog was a hot concept all the way back in 2009. At the time it had four units in Southern California and now it's one of the 10 biggest uh, restaurant chains in its category. So well done to Lazy Dog. And also, you know, all the chains in that segment had a very good year last year. There's Italian slash pizza. Couple chains in that category grew sales last year by over 50%, uh, which even for a really good year is still in like astronomical number. Uh, there's mid-scale dining, which is like what we sometimes call family dining colloquially. Uh, in this category, Village Inn had a really big year, which surprised me in a pleasant way because uh, Village Inn filed bankruptcy uh, back in January 2020, uh, or rather its parent company at the time filed bankruptcy. Uh, so it had a rough go of it for a couple years, but it opened 24 net units last year. So it is back on track. We love to see that with these brands that go bankrupt. Uh, we love to see them get their footing back. Uh, and then, of course, we have sports bars, which are always fun to look at. Uh, also a big category last year with some chains that did some huge growth. So that's kind of an overview of how the full service uh, restaurants did last year. It's all broken down in much more detail online. Do you think that the increase of global cuisine has to do with the fact that the world is more global now than it was even a year ago? It could be. It could be, you know, consumers are seeking out different kinds of food. I think a lot of people got into some ruts in like 2020, 2021. We were all eating a lot of pizza and sandwiches and going the same places every day if we were going anywhere at all or rather having those things delivered to our homes. Uh, so it could be consumers expanding their palates. Uh, that's definitely a good call, but yeah, I was, I was, uh, pleasantly surprised to see that category grow. And of course, barbecue feels a little out of place, like in that category, but it just comes down to like having to file restaurants somewhere. Um, but for example, Smoky Bones falls into that category. Um, and we just said they had a great year. So yeah, that's definitely, definitely probably at least one contributing factor there. Well, you like cover barbecue full is, service, is just and so like full service is includes everything that you know you sit down for, but also that kind of struggled mm -hmm. with delivery over COVID. Do you, how do you think that's kind of sort of played into the mix? Yeah, you know, like I said, um, full service as a whole had such a such a good year um, last year. You know, of the, those six categories, they all grew sales. Five of them added net new units. Um, but a lot of that does have to do with the fact that these numbers are measured year over year. So we're comparing 2022 full service to 2021 full service. And in 2021, a lot of consumers were still not going to restaurants. They were having their food delivered or they were going to get takeout. And yes, a lot of consumers do tend to gravitate more toward limited service in that case. Uh, so I definitely think that that, you know, is a part of this. But at the same time, Full service brands, as much as anyone else, have made huge strides in terms of their um, off premises service over the last year or so. If I may briefly plug our October issue, which just went to press, uh, it's our annual off premises report, and we get into a lot of the nitty gritty uh, by brand, by off premises type. 
Um, and full service restaurants are definitely making huge strides in that area. Joanne, I cut you off before. So what were you going to say? Oh, I was just saying that um, I think that barbecue has just exploded as a category in recent years. I feel like it used to be associated really with just like one-off independent restaurants uh, vying for the top position in, in Texas. But I feel like it's just, it's been introduced to most markets and um, I feel like there are a lot of really interesting growing chains out there. Yeah, and I feel barbecue like soul is... food is another one. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Leah. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say the barbecue is fascinating because it can be broken down even further into like Texas barbecue and North Carolina barbecue. And like, it's not like every state has their own style of barbecue. And I was fascinated when we did our barbecue showdown by how passionate consumers are um, about their favorite barbecue chain. Uh, people were really like throwing down in the comments for their favorites. So it's uh, definitely an interesting one to watch. And oddly enough, the winner of our barbecue showdown does barbecue from each place. It's not just a single type like Texas barbecue. It does barbecue from all around the country. So sure. everybody just likes barbecue, period, I think, is what, what that is. And now I feel like having barbecue for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens when you do the way. podcast show, Anna. <laughs> <laughs> That's just like on the podcast. You're hungry. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, so I was going to say... You know, one of the restaurants we have as a hot concept this year is Cornbread, which is a soul food restaurant. And I feel like that's sort of the next level of what's up and coming where barbecue was a few years ago. I feel like soul food is coming up in that in the wake. Um, and so Cornbread wants to be a national chain. They're already franchising. Um, but I feel like it's it's also elevating a lot of people's cuisine that, you know, hasn't really seen a lot of attention before. And, and we haven't seen a chain like that. And I think that's going to be the next barbecue and barbecue is going to be the next like Italian food or something. So I think we're all moving things up the line and moving into more flavors from the country and more areas that people necessarily haven't eaten before. Like, I don't know how many people in the Northeast have eaten soul food. So I think that's also an interesting thing that they can bring to the whole country. Yeah, it'll yeah, be interesting to keep our pulse on that, uh, on that segment in the coming years and to see, you know, Right now, there are, I said, you know, four or five regions in the top 10, five. So of those 10 restaurants, they represent five regions. It'll be interesting to see um, if and when more regions break into that category. Maybe we'll start breaking some of those out, you know? Yeah, that could be interesting. All right, well, thank you guys for joining me. And I'm going to throw it over to Alicia Kelso, who interviewed Francis Allen of Checkers and Rallies. Hi, this is Alicia Kelso. I'm the executive editor of Nations Restaurant News. I am in Amelia Island, Florida uh, for the Prosper Forum, and I am so excited. I've got Francis Allen here, the CEO of Checkers Rallies. Uh, fun fact, Francis and I have spoken several times throughout the past three years, but we are just now meeting in real life, real person <laughs> for the first time ever, and like an old friend. And I'm, I'm so grateful that you took the time to talk to me today. So thank you, Francis, and welcome. Uh, absolutely, Alicia. It's a great, great to meet you in person <laughs> and uh, lovely to spend some time with you. Yeah, it's 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 fun, always funny to translate the screen to to real life. I feel like this is a strange year in doing that. But let's talk about Checkers Rallies because we, um, you know, that's why we're here. So we're at about eight hundred total units for both brands, correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, and from what I understand, our data central partners, um, both sales and unit counts were up year over year the past couple years. Um, so tell me, you know, what, what seems to be sort of working for you guys, especially given the challenging backdrop that we've been dealing with as an industry? Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Last year was very difficult with, uh, with inflation. I guess you could say the last three years have been difficult between COVID and then with staffing and then inflation. And let's hope that this year we're actually settling down to normal, whatever new, the new normal is. I think where we've really um, changed over the last few years is leaning into e-commerce, delivery, uh, looking for ways of making the restaurant more efficient, uh, looking at ways to actually make our employees' lives easier. And so we've uh, dedicated one of our drive-through lanes to e-commerce, which was a huge benefit for both employees and the, and the customer. 
And uh, and we've also put in voice-activated ordering at the drive-through, which makes that drive-through position so much easier. And and the guest doesn't seem to mind. They're used to talking to a, a a robot or a machine at home, whether it's through Google Home or uh, or um, Amazon. So they they they've taken to it quite naturally. But it helps our employees so much sure. uh, in terms of just not being so stressed at that position and actually creating more opportunities for other benefits as well. Great, yeah. I- People who covered this industry are probably well aware you are a pretty early mover mover here on drive through AI, um, and I, I, you know, that that is an, a really interesting story. Do the employees play with it? I mean, I I, I spoke to your uh, VP of development, Chris McDonald, and she was telling me it actually adds some joy to their job. So what kind of efficiencies are you seeing both on the labor side and then are you actually seeing results yet or is it still too early on the consumer side? So uh, on the, on the, the, the efficiency side, it's about the speed with which you can get new trainees uh, trained up. That drive-through position is so hard. You've got to, it's multitasking on steroids and you've got to take an, an order from the person in front of you, expedite uh, the, sorry, take an order from the, at the, at the menu um, speaker box, expedite the order for the person in front. And then uh, we're also asking you to not make a mistake and to be really friendly and do it super fast. Mm-hmm. So I mean, incredibly stressful and we've just taken all that away. And in addition, uh, we've seen that accuracy has improved is more consistent um, uh, upselling. Um, the um, the speed has got a little better, and um, the, so the the guest is happier and the employee is happier because they're just not so stressed. And sure. it gives them that chance to actually be hospitable mm-hmm. and say please and thank you because they're because they're not stressed. Are you so, system wide now? Not quite. So um, we are finishing rolling out in all our company restaurants and our franchisees are are adopting it increasingly at an increasing speed. So um, we actually have, um, uh, we've got, I think, 50 more franchise going this year. We we had about 100 uh, installed last year. So it's getting there. Okay. So you have the case study here from the corporate side and now the franchisees are starting to get a little more bullish on this. So you're yes. you're all in on this. Oh, yeah, all, all in. Okay. All in. And in fact, if we tried to take it away from our restaurants, I think our employees would revolt. Well, and I think that's interesting because obviously your concept is drive through heavy. Um, and, and so, you know, if you guys are bullish on this, then I think that kind of speaks, you know, to, to how the industry might play into this as a whole. I mean, do you think that others will ambitiously follow here? I think they will. Uh, I, I can't speak to what they're testing. I know that we have a genius IT uh, leader and team who managed to make it work. Uh, we work with Presto and another company called High Auto, who came up with the, the software in the first place. And we didn't put it in a restaurant until we got to 95% accuracy. And by accuracy, I mean in 95% of times, the machine would understand what the customer was asking for and and uh, not get confused. Mm-hmm. And now, to me, that's incredible because I have this kind of quasi-British, American, or is she Australian accent going on, <laughs> and uh, Siri doesn't understand what I say. <laughs> uh, but we have uh, partners that have helped us develop a system where all the colloquialisms, all the, oh no, hold the ketchup yeah. and can we go back and change, you know, she follows along. We call her she because it's a female voice. Um, but it, it, it's quite incredible and it's uh, it's a result of um, genius IT people on both our side and our partner's side that have made it happen. So I don't know why other companies aren't diving into it, but we're certainly thrilled. Great. All right. And you talked again about uh, labor efficiencies. Tell me, 
how that's working on the kitchen side, because I know that you've sort of reconfigured things back a house right. and and just sort of paint some really quick color on on what that has what what that's meant that project. Yeah, so uh, our our restaurants, so let's say they're an average of thirty twenty five to thirty years old. Um, and the kitchen equipment had just been placed. As we put, brought in new platforms, we put a piece of machinery where there was a space. And we did a study that that uh, showed us that our employees at an average restaurant were collectively walking an additional mile, unnecessary mile and a half every hour. Uh, and so uh, that was a real eye-opening moment for us. Our, our equipment was also old and needed updating. So we, uh, we, we undertook to do a whole kitchen overhaul move pieces around, add, pe- add pieces that it were going to improve the quality of the, of the food and the ease of, of training. So uh, we rolled that out and we started rolling that out in 21 and, and uh, we'll finish this year. Great. And you're seeing some... The quality of the food has improved, the, the ease sense. of assembly, the ease of training. I mean, getting someone up to speed. I mean, even... A neophyte in the in the kitchen like me could learn to use a clamshell grill in 20 minutes. Right, you know? right. So it, it's really been a, a great benefit, especially with all the turnover issues yeah. that the whole industry has seen over the last couple of years. Yeah, and I, I, I've been so fascinated with that story in particular. We've covered efficiency a lot, and that just, it seems really simple on paper, but... You know, just to dive in and actually do the work is not so simple, as we, as you and I both know. Um you guys are also leading it in a little bit into more modular units for some of your development. Tell me a little bit about that. So we're actually, uh, we have a modular building. We fit on a, 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 a footprint that's about half the size mm-hmm. of other brands. Um, was we don't have a dining room. It's just double drive through. Our brand has always been about ease and convenience, No kind of no nonsense frills. And uh, so we um, have been using a modular building. It's prefabricated. It cuts down the development time. I'd like to say it cuts down the cost a lot as well, but like everything else, and over the last few years, uh, the the, the cost of buildings has gone up dramatically. Uh, But it, it is certainly a really efficient way and and relatively cost effective way of growing fast and um and everything comes with it so you just need to put the foundation and then the modular yeah. building on top great well that's exciting you you mentioned it yourself costs yes um so are we i know that you recently um you know restructured some of your debt are we are we past some of those challenges of those pain points that unprecedented if I, I don't know how to set this up more dramatically right, right. <laughs> from the past three right. years you know tell me yeah. where your position now that you've made that move yep and uh, you know are you optimistic that the sort of the worst the the biggest pain points are behind us yes <laughs> <laughs> fair enough <laughs> yes and, and, well I mean we've we've now got a much stronger balance sheet uh, and I'm incredibly grateful to our lenders that that know that we've got a lot of a, a, a great future ahead of us and they want to join in that future with us right. and so they've they've reduced the amount of debt um, that's on our books and uh, and as a result you know very very healthy uh, balance sheet lots of cash so no we're we're ready to go good good all right well last question what's next then what what can we expect now that you feel better about the worst being behind us now that your balance sheet's healthier so we are uh, two things. I think one is we've got to stabilize our operations. Uh, we've seen over the, the last three years, um, you know, all of the, ch- the challenges of, of staffing. We've got to get to more consistent operations and we've got to uh, upgrade the look of our restaurants. So we haven't really remodeled in 25, 30 years. Uh, and we've now got a, a very, very compelling remodel program that is doing gangbusters. Okay. And uh, it, 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 we are seeing really industry-leading results uh, coming out of that remodel. So we want to get uh, our stores uh, to look to uh, to this new look as fast as we possibly yeah. can. How far are you along on that? Oh, we've only got about 10 stores so okay. far, but all of them are doing incredibly well. Okay. And uh, we're, we're 
really um, cost engineering okay. the, the, the remodel down to the absolute um, lowest cost we can, and, and then we'll be rolling it out. All right. I trust she'll keep me posted when we get more than 10. <laughs> I would love to have that follow-up uh, conversation with you. I would be delighted <laughs> okay. to. We've got, okay. we've got five in Jacksonville. We, we've, we've looked at how what happens when you remodel a whole market, Yeah, and uh, that market is on fire. Right. So Great. I will be happy to come back and report. And you've got some optimism. Seems like you're optimistic, Francis. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I, we've got a great future ahead of us. Okay. Great. Well, thank you for sharing, you know, all the updates on checkers and rallies and It's always fun talking to you. I really appreciate your time. Likewise. Thank you. Great to talk to you, Alyssa.